right, let's get to it. This is round two of Paul Foster Case's The Classic Guide, The Tarot, A Key to the Wisdom of the Ages. What I got playing here is a subliminal audio to roll by neural beats. We're going right out to that. Now, if you if you roll with me earlier, shoot, almost four hours uh, to cover 36 pages. I figured out why the audio was so bad because I was actually playing the same binaural beat through my laptop at the same time. If you can push through the quality of the audio, some good information was discussed. Definitely not going to read it again, at least not now. But I do want to finish this book. Uh, where we left off at was at the magician card. So without further ado, let's get it cracking. Uh, key one, the magician, Beth. Beth, B, value two, means house. The first thing about a house is its location determined by survey and application of geometry. In its building, architecture, geometry, adaptation of materials, and many other practical applications of science are involved. Time was when the whole art of building was called a mystery and was under the direction of the priests of Thoth, Nemo, Nebo, Hermes, Mercury. House building is part of hermetic science and Survivals of this idea are preserved in the rituals of Freemasonry. And what it means by that is uh, a lot of times a building that's being constructed, they will call on Freemasons to lay the cornerstone because building is uh, what the science of Freemasonry is surrounded by. Mercury is the astrological attribution to Beth. It represents both the planet and the God. Understand by God an aspect of universal consciousness personified, not talking about a literal person. The gods are the Elohim of the Hebrew scriptures, wherein it is written of man, I said, ye are gods. To Mercury or Hermes, Hiram, the Egyptians attributed their 42 books of science, embracing astronomy, astrology, arithmetic, geometry, medicine, grammar, logic, rhetoric, music, magic, and so on. Mercury or Hermes was the great magician transformer, bearing the caduceus or wand of miracles, which survives to this day as a symbol of the healing arts. He was nevertheless only the messenger of a divinity higher than himself, merely the transmitter. If you think of Mercury, uh, he was the messenger between God and man, uh, represents spirit, spirit. Astrologically, Mercury, the Mercury vibration represents intellect. In the color scale used throughout these lessons, it is yellow, the color assigned to spirit and air, but a deeper tint than that assigned to Uranus. The musical tone is the same, e natural. Beth is one of the seven double letters, so-called because they have in Hebrew, both a hard and soft pronunciation. To every double letter is assigned a pair of opposites, to Beth and Mercury, because the letter and planet designate an aspect of consciousness which destroys as easily as it creates. The pair assigned is life and death. Intelligence of, transparent, of transparency is the mode of consciousness. Transpar tra transparency means letting light shine through. Here we have the same idea of transmission that is suggested by Hermes as the transmitter of the messages of the higher divinity. Clearly the mode of consciousness called transparent must be one which affords a free channel of communication two ways, which permits the free passage downward and outward of the superconscious light, which is above and within. Above is the direction assigned to Beth because the mode of consciousness corresponds to the letter. Wait, let me go back. Above is the direction assigned to Beth 
because the mode of consciousness corresponding to the letter is the superior term of human personal consciousness. As Hermes was the herald of the gods directing the soul, according to Egyptian mythology, through the mysteries of the underworld or night side of nature, so is the superior phase of human personal consciousness, the initiator and the conductor of human personality through the mazes of life. It is the number one consciousness, the ego consciousness, the I am I, which is sometimes called objective mind. But because it is first of all consciousness of the indwelling presence of the, con of the super conscious self, let's read that again, that was a mouthful. It is the number one consciousness, the ego consciousness, the I am I, which is sometimes called objective mind. But because it is first of all consciousness of the indwelling presence of the superconscious self, we prefer to term it self-consciousness. It is the onlooker, the director, the superior, superior personal mode of universal conscious energy. It is your everyday waking consciousness. Hmm. Hmm. I like it a lot. Um, the magician is the correct title key one used in all versions of tarot belonging to occult fraternities, though it is sometimes debased into the juggler in exoteric packs. Magic is simply the ancient name for science, particularly for hermetic science. The true magic presides over house building because it shows All right, I didn't mean to do that, but we're going to write it out. Uh, the true magic presides over house building because it shows how to erect actual houses so as to take advantage of occult properties of the earth currents of magnetic vibration. The higher phases of magic, moreover, have to do with the building of the house of personality, with the rearing of the temple of spirit, the house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That was the first thing that came to my mind just now, is uh, the house not made with hands, which is uh, the temple. The, on a very mundane level, it applies to you because you were created without hands in your mother's womb, but it also refers to the spiritual temple that we build uh, in the etheric and astral planes and above. The magic of light presides over life and death because it has to do with laws and principles whereby self-conscious states of mind initiate and determine subconscious reactions. Let's read that again. The magic of light presides over life and death because it has to do with laws and principles whereby self-conscious states of mind initiate and determine subconscious reactions. Uh, for most, it's the opposite. For most, it is autopilot and the subconscious is running the show. So here we see the magician uh, reverses this aspect. The magician reverses this aspect and he makes it um, a matter of self-consciousness and forces the subconscious to react. Um, every true magician knows that all his practice has a mathematical geometrical basis. By the aid of occult geometry, he has traced nature to her concealed recesses. He uses geometry formula and diagrams in his practical work. Um, one thing I've noticed in my work with Kabbalah although I won't call it super advanced, I don't speak Hebrew and I'm just learning uh, Tarot. However, um, what I've learned from my experience is that the Kabbalistic tree of life is meant to be experienced and not intellectualized. And I think that's where a lot of people who 
contend themselves to be superior to those who don't speak Hebrew, who don't have the Hebrew uh, letters on lock and who aren't made just adepti of the Tarot. Um, if they haven't had that personal experience, then it's all for naught. It's all just uh, intellectualized. It is not of an internal process. Look at my incense up while we're talking, just to keep the mood set. Send these prayers up to the ethers and affect my dreams tonight. Take a quick sip. So let's get back to where we were. This cat keep bothering my green screen. Stop task. Okay, let's get back to it. Finally, though he knows himself to be above nature, he understands that his operations succeed to the degree that his thought, word, and actions transmit. Come on, Taz, stop. Oh, wow. Okay, let me ride with it. This spirit. So let's ride with it. If you want to attack the green screen, have at it. Uh. Finally, though he knows himself to be above nature, he understands that his operations succeed to the, to the degree that his thought, word, and action transmit faithfully the powers of the plane above him. The greatest magicians know themselves to be no more than channels for the life power, clear window panes through which the light of wisdom within the house of personality streams forth into the objective world. The arbor of roses, over the magician's head corresponds to the letter name Beth, because an arbor is the simplest type of shelter. Okay. Red roses, sim symbols of Venus, represent the desire of nature. Here, they suggest that the power which the magician draws from above is modified or qualified by desire. That's something I've been on tough myself recently. I'm realizing that. The combination of desire and will is what makes everything happen, good and bad. And as a magician, or even better, as an occultist, you need to cultivate your will and desire, exercise your will. And I realized tonight that the reason why it's always suggested that you be in the now, in the moment, pay attention to yourself, is because once you reach a certain level, your thoughts become things. And so if you wanna truly manifest uh, your desires and bring them into accordance with your will, you can't have just random thoughts floating around because then you're working against yourself. Uh, this is true of all self-conscious activity. Every moment of our waking consciousness is motivated and conditioned by some type of desire. The horizontal figure eight over the magician's head is the ancient occult number ascribed to Hermes. See the explanation of the number eight in chapter two. We'll go back real quick and reread that. Number eight. Um, it says here, Thus, in mathematics, the figure eight written horizontally is the sign of infinity. Among its occult meanings are rhythm, alternate cycles of involution and evolution, vibration, flux and reflux, and the like. It represents also the fact that opposite forms of expression, that is, all pairs of opposites, are effects of a single cause. The number eight is the digit value of the name IHVH Jehovah. 888 is the numeration of the name Jesus in Greek. And eight is not only the dom dom dominic dominical number or number of the Lord in Christian numeral symbolism, but is also the particular number of the God called Thoth by Egyptians, Nebo by Assyrians, Hermes by Greeks, and Mercury by Romans. Thus eight is preeminently the number of magic and of hermetic science. Its Hebrew name is Splendor, and the aspect of consciousness to which it corresponds is called perfect intelligence. The Hebrew adjective translated perfect 
is SHLM. A noun spelled with the same letters means peace, security, health, wealth, satisfaction, and thus refers to the perfect realization the success represents represented by the number seven. Um, this horizontal eight, which is similar to Aurora Borealis, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It means dominion on the horizontal plane, that is, dominion in material affairs, which is what a major is striving to do. Uh, dominion, not in dominate, but power over, power of. Um, that is dominion in material matter affairs, because one of the oldest symbols of matter is the horizontal line. In contrast to the fool's yellow locks, the black hair of the magician signifies ignorance, yet this ignorance is limited by knowledge, for a white crown encircles the magus's brow. It passes round his forehead at the location of the brain areas, particularly active and self-conscious mentation. I'm going back to look. Yeah. So his hair is black, which signifies ignorance, which is something that I come across quite regularly in my studies and research is every now and then I have to just remind myself that I don't know nothing. I don't, you know, whatever I think I know, I'm just scratching the surface. So that's dope. His uplifted right hand suggests power drawn from above. The wand it holds aloft is a double-ended phallic symbol. It is phallic because the nerve force used to maintain the reproductive functions may be purified and sublimated by certain magical procedures. Hmm. Wonder what he means by that. I'm going to give that some more thought. It's two points exactly alike in form remind us of the hermetic axiom that which is below is as that which is above, excuse me, and that which is above is as that which is below for the performance of the miracles of the one thing. Now, if you think about it, the pictures of pointing up above and down and, and up, up and down, there are a lot of uh, notorious figures that does this, but also some holy ones. The Christ does it. Uh, uh, Buddha does it. Um, of course, Baphomet, and there are others. And so they all signify the same thing. Um, nothing nefarious, nothing, um, you know, nothing of the sort that would uh, to be alarmed of or to make you think that you can't. Um, redeem your soul or anything like that. It's just um, signifying that which is above it is akin to what's below. The law of correspondence. Let's get back to it. They also indicate subtly that the lower manifestations of the force here symbolized are not destroyed nor atrophied in the process of purification and sublimation. Finally, the two points refer to the duality of all magical operations, which are of two great classes, those leading to the higher expressions of life and those resulting in death. The, mag the magician's down pointing left hand symbolizes direction of power to a plane below. It makes the gesture of concentration. The pointing finger is that attributed to the planet Jupiter. From this finger, Palmist judged the degree of a client's power of leadership and direction. It is the execution and determinative finger. The gesture plainly conveys the notion that concentration is the secret of direction and control of forces below the plane of self-consciousness. Of the double gesture made by the magician's hands, Dr. Waite says, this dual sign is known in very high grades of the instituted mysteries. It shows the descent of grace, virtue, and light, drawn from things above and derived to things below. The situation throughout is therefore the possession and communication of the powers and gifts of the spirit. The magician's white inner robe has the same significance as the white garments of the fool. 
the serpent, the serpent girdle signifies wisdom. Oh, okay, take it back. The serpent girdle signifies wisdom, serpent, and eternity biting its his tail. Dr. Way says here it indicates more especially the eternity of attainment in the spirit. The serpent is colored blue-green because it is also a symbol of the serpent force, which is utilized in all magical practice. And that serpent would have to be Kundalini. It would have to be. Let's see how it could be anything else other than Kundalini that a magician would use a serpentine energy at least. At least. So let's see. Let's continue. Um, the magician's red outer garment represents desire, passion, and activity. Its color is that of the planet Mars, which astrology associates with action and initiative. This red robe has no binding girdle. It may be slipped on or off at the magician's pleasure. This means that self-consciousness may enter into action or abstain from it according to circumstances. Thus, this bit of symbolism is connected with the power of choice or of selection, characteristic of self-consciousness. I would say it even applies to silence. I would say it even applies to silence, the, the act of choosing to speak or choosing not to speak. The table before the magician represents the field of attention in modern psychology. The word table has also affinities in language with the word measurement, and as much as to classify and arrange is to tabulate. Note that the corners of the table had to be squared and that the cylindrical legs, which have capitals like ionic columns, required the use of compasses, and by their capitals suggest the orders of architecture. Um, the five orders of architecture are Tuscan, Dor, Guyanic, Corinthian, and Composite. Now, most might be thinking, what does architecture and columns have to do with uh, Tarot and spirituality? Well, actually, those five orders of architecture represent your consciousness as well as your relationship to deity. So uh, Tuscan is very plain and it works its way up to composite, which is uh, actually a synthesis and a complex relationship. So uh, there are those who have, uh, let's say, a Tuscan consciousness or a Tuscan relationship with deity. Nothing wrong with that. It'll suit them well, and it'll get them places. And they may even travel further than someone who aspires to the highest of the five, which is composite. Um, where are we? Okay. On the table in front of the magician, writes Dr. Wade, are the implements of the four tarot suits, signifying the elements of natural life, which lie like counters before the adept. And he adapts them as he wills. As elements of natural life, they refer to fire, wand, water, cup, air, sword, and earth, coin, or pentacle. They symbolize also the four worlds, and correspond to the letters IHVH. The magician's problem is to arrange them in proper order. In ceremonial magic, these implements are the staff, the cup of libations and divination, the magic sword, and the pentacle or talisman. On the pentacle are written or engraved words, numbers, geometrical figures, and sigils. These are determined by the nature of the magical operation to be affected by the powers they represent. In this instance, the sigil on the pentagram is the pentalpha, the five-pointed star or pentagram of this sign in Lagos Levy says, the pentagram expresses the mind's domination over the elements. And it is by this sign that we bind the demons of the air the spirits of fire, the specters of water, and the ghosts of earth. It is the star of the Magi, the burning star of the Gnostic schools, the sign of intellectual omnipotence and autocracy. 
It is the symbol of the word made flesh. That's powerful. The sign of the pentagram is called also the sign of the microcosm. Its complete comprehension is the key of the two worlds. It is absolute natural philosophy and natural science. The magician is a powerful soul. He's powerful. The embodiment of as above, so below. That cat is wilding out, but that's what he do. He's really just doing it because he has to. Okay, from the foregoing quotation, you may come to understand the nature of the work to which the magician in Tarot is directing his powers. Be careful not to take the first sentence of the question of the quotation too literally. In the first sentences, the pentagram expresses the mind's domination over the elements, and it is by this sign that we bind the demons of air, the spirits of fire, the specters of water, and the ghosts of the earth. And I'm pretty sure the reason why he says don't take that first sentence too, too uh, literally is because that scares people, especially when they hear ghosts, demons, or anything in that nature. But what it brings to mind for me are the elemental spirits, like uh, what is the salamander for fire, gnomes for earth, uh, uh, Sylphs for air, and I forget what's for water. But either way, that's what comes to mind. Um, there is a meaning behind the surface meaning. Find it yourself. So I'm pretty sure I'm close. Uh, just can't think of the fourth one for water. I know the salamanders fire, gnomes are earth, sylphs are air. I don't know why it's leaving my mind at the moment. From the four, uh, let's see. In practical everyday life, the implements of the magician are the four life essentials. Light, which is the wand of fire. Water, which is the cup. Air, which is the sword. And food, pentacle. Hmm. So in practical everyday life, the implements of the magicians are the four life essentials. Light, water, air, and food. This brings to mind the fact that the magician should not be a starving artist. The magician is entitled to abundance. Please believe it. The combination of these life essentials in proper order and proportions is the task of every practical occultist. Finally, the four elements correspond to the four ancient esoteric admonitions, which sum up the whole practical application of occult law. These admonitions are one, to will, wand, Two, to know, cup. Three, to dare, sword. Four, to be silent, pentacle. Mm. Pentacle represents... Uh, hmm. Earth, the spade, the shovel, the grave. That's a, don't get any more silent than that for most. The magician's garden is the antithesis to the barren height whereon stands the fool. The garden is fertile and productive, as your magical virtue should be. Uh, you, you should be seeing results. I don't care what you're working on, what you're doing. Uh, it should be bountiful. You should see results. If you're not, you have to question uh, the work. You have to question your work. Like the magician, your garden should be alive it should be a, a demonstration of magical prowess not that it's a competition or you want the biggest cassava melons on the block but it should definitely be green and growing and representative of your work at least that's what i get out of it uh, let's get back to it um uh the garden is fertile and productive. It is a symbol of the subconscious plane of mental activity. 
From this teeming soil come forth the productions which give shape and form to the ideas of the magician. He is shown as a gardener like Adam, of whom an old legend says that he was put into the Garden of Eden to grow roses. Hmm. Brings to mind also with the rose, we have the rosy cross of the Rosicrucian order, and then we just had Easter just, you know, not too long ago. And the thing that's always said on Easter is he rose, he rose. Like Adam, self-consciousness is the namer of objects. Like Adam, personal self-consciousness is formed by the power of the Lord, who is that which was, is, and shall be. Like Adam, the personal self-consciousness is formed of the dust of the ground, because self-consciousness is an aggregate of myriads of tiny sense impressions, dust, originating in that cosmic operation of the life power, which makes the environment of personality and is the true ground or basis of all self-conscious experience. I think he's emphasizing Adam as to re reference Adam Ketman of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. Beneath the rice, Dr. Waite, are roses and lilies, the floss compi and lilium convallium, changed into garden flowers to show the culture of aspiration. Roses, red roses typify Venus and the desire nature. White lilies represent abstract thought untinged by desire, a balance of desire and will. The roses are developed from the five petaled wild rose, and thus they symbolize the number five. Number five would be Gebera, which has for its geometrical correspondence the pentagram. As symbols of desire, they represent the phase of some subconscious response to self-conscious direction, which has to do with art, invention, and the adaptation of the principles of abstract truth to practical ends, because all desires are related to sensation and what to sensation. There are five roses corresponding to the conventional five senses. Okay, let me move this back. So you leave it alone. Uh, you have to understand that right now I'm intruding upon his sacred space. Normally I'd be in the room sleep. So I get him, lights is on. Uh, and he's tripping, he's lodging his protest as we speak. But guess what? He better roll with it and get rolled over. Um, Lilies have six petals, and in cross sections, their flowers show the hexagram or six pointed star. Six pointed star is related to Christ, uh, Tiferet, and the cross, as well as the square. I wonder if the five petal rows correspond to the core, to the compass. Most likely so. I wouldn't bet. Um, or six-pointed star, which is, this, let's start over. Lilies have six petals, and in cross-section, their flowers show the hexagram of six-pointed star, which is the symbol of the macrocosm. Pure science concerns itself with the study of powers of the macrocosm and with the laws of those powers, because these laws and forces operate in the four worlds or planes mentioned in chapter one. The number of lilies shown in the picture is four, Thus, all meaning of the letter Beth, the number one, and the symbol of the magician refers to powers of the, of the self-conscious phase of personal mental activity. These powers are directed primarily to the control of forces and things below the self-conscious level. The energy utilized comes from above, from superconsciousness. It is fixed and modified by acts of attention Concentration is the great secret of the magical art. 
True concentration is perfect transparency in which personality becomes a free, unobstructed channel for the passage downward and outward of the superconscious radiant energy. Herein, the secret of true volition and, and alive as Levy tells us all magic is in the wheel. That's something that has been impressed on me a lot lately. I actually did a podcast on the Wisdom app concerning Desire and Will with Carlton Burns. And um, uh, it hasn't left my mind yet. Uh, matter of fact, real soon I'm going to upload uh, that to here. Uh, Wisdom app is all audio, so no visual, but still uh, some good stuff was discussed. And I'm going to get that up soon. Real soon. Okay, the next card is the High Priestess. High Priestess. Let me pull that High Priestess card out. Well, I'm at it. Got the Rider Waite deck. Figure. Even though most likely tomorrow uh, we're going to continue on the magician, I'm going to roll through this book and do my best to um, read it all tonight. And that way uh, I can knock down a book. I don't want to linger. I would like to read one tarot book every week or two, which might be pushing it too far, but I'm going to give it a try. Okay, The High Priestess. Uh, this is chapter uh, six. Key two, The High Priestess. Gimel. Gimel's a camel. That much I didn't know. I don't know much Hebrew, but I know Gimel represents a camel. Camel is a sand serpent of Kundalini. Um, Gimel, third letter of the Hebrew letter, of the Hebrew alphabet is a double letter. Its name means camel because camels are used for transportation, for carrying goods from one place to another. The letter name suggests travel, communication, commerce, and like ideas because the merchants and pilgrims use camels in making journeys together. Gimel suggests association, combination, coexistence, partnership, and the like because a camel has means for carrying extra supplies of water. It symbolizes moisture. Finally, the camel is the ship of the desert and its hump, and its humps look, look something like a crescent. Okay. Gimel is represented in English by the letter G, which has also a hard and soft pronunciation. Hard as in girl and soft as in geranium. The numeral value of Gimel in Hebrew arithmetic and in reckoning the numeration of Hebrew words is three. The moon is the celestial body assigned to Gimel. First, because the moon is a satellite accompanying the earth. Second, because the moon waxes and wanes just as a caravan is first seen as a tiny dust cloud on the rim of the desert, then grows larger and larger until it stops a while in some oasis city, and then grows smaller and smaller as it journeys thence on its way to its next destination. Third, because the lunar crescent resembles the shape of a camel's hump. Also because as the camel is the ship of the desert, so is the moon the ship of the skies. Finally, the desert, finally, the astrological nature of the moon is cold and moist. The moon is the astrological symbol of personality and of memories carried from one incarnation to another by the subconscious mind. In our color scale, the tint assigned to the moon is blue. There's a lot of blue in the, uh, the High Empress card, corresponding to the musical note, the musical tone, G sharp or eight flat. As a double letter, Gimel de designates the pair of opposites, peace and strife. For, as in the world of peace and war, are mainly dictated by the conditions of commerce, communication, and transportation. So, 
in human personality, adjustment or maladjustment are largely determined by the response of subconsciousness to the things and people with whom we are brought into communication. Uniting intelligence is the mode of consciousness attributed to Gimel. You know what? I'm sitting here reading. I need to be taking notes. Earlier, I was on my sacral chakra. Uh, I had to get busy, get in the traffic, took a shower, changed clothes. So now I got my, the mind is all T on, repping that C. Freeman L energy. So I just want to, um, highlight some of these things so I can come back to that. Um, let's see here. Gimel, the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet is a double letter. It means camel because camels are used for transportation for carrying goods from one place to another. The letter name suggests travel. And like ideas because merchants and pilgrims use camels in making journeys. Gimel suggests, Gimel suggests combination, coexistence, partnership, and the like. Because camels, because a camel has means for carrying extra supplies of water, it symbolizes moisture. And that makes sense because the moon tugs and pulls at the ocean. And then finally, the camel is the ship of the desert, and its hump looks like a crescent. And then we go back, give me some more. And it says here, because, because the lunar crescent resembles the shape of a camel's hump, also because as the camel is the ship of the desert, so is the moon the ship of the skies. Finally, the astrological nature of the moon is cold and moist. The moon is the astrological symbol of personality and memories carried from one incarnation to another by the subconscious mind. The moon is symbolized by the astrological sign of cancer. And it too deals with uh, incarnation because essentially we are all birthed through cancer, which is the moon. And we are, we all pass through, uh, Capricorn, the goat exiting the body. I believe I it's in uh, Porphyry's, uh, Porphyry's The Cave of the Nymphs. The Cave of Nymphs is uh, a Greek allegory for initiation and reincarnation. Good to read. Um, good to read. Uh, Porphyry, P O R P H Y, Porphyry. I forget how to spell it, but it's a good book. Well, good allegory. Um, let's see. So what I also read through, because again, I'm, I apologize, I'm going back because I'm not just reading to you all, I'm actually studying and I got caught up in reading for a moment. Um, as a double letter, Gimel designates the pair of opposites, peace and strife, for, as in the world, peace and war are mainly dictated by conditions of commerce. And we everybody knows that. War is a matter of money. So I'm going to read the rest of that just to reiterate. It says, that's a double letter. Get more designates the pair of opposites, peace and strife. For as in the world, so for as in the world, peace and war are mainly dictated by the conditions of commerce, communication, and transportation. So, in human personality, adjustment or maladjustment are largely determined by the response of the subconsciousness to the things and people with whom we are brought into communication. So.
our reality is dictated essentially by our reactions, but you don't want to react. <clears throat> At least that's my understanding of it all. Um, He's, let me see again. Well, he didn't use the word react, he used the word response. And so I like that better because um, a response, it implies uh, thinking, thought, uh, more deliberate and patient. So yeah, I can rock with that, most definitely. Um, united intelligence is the mode of consciousness attributed to Gimel. As transportation, camel and caravan brings distant places nearer together. So this card can also symbolize a bringing together of distant, distant places. Um, and establishes communication between them. So does subconsciousness, which is the connecting medium between human personalities unite us to one another regardless of distance subconscious is the agency of telepathic communication or as jung would put it the collective unconscious i've recently come to understanding that while we all share the uh collective unconscious most don't realize that the collective unconscious is the world of dreams we all share the same dream believe it or not and so i definitely want to highlight these it says uniting intelligence is the mode of consciousness attributed to gamma as transportation camel and caravans bring distant, distant places nearer together and establish communication between them. So does subconsciousness, which is the connected medium between human personalities, unite us to one another, regardless of distance. Subconsciousness is the agency of telepathic communication, because believe it or not, we all are one. That's the only reason why we share a collective unconscious. That's the only reason why we share the world of dreams, because there's only one. I don't care how much you hate whatever. We are one. We are one. Who was that? Uh, not Teddy Pendergrass. This old school song that says that, that we are one. Uh, below is the direction. Uh, um, below is the direction attributed to Kimmel, Gimmel. That which is below is secondary, subordinate, dependent, under control, subject to command, and obedient. All these ideas are clearly related to the idea of Campbell. As an obedient beast of burden, they relate in consciousness to the subordinate element of personal subconsciousness, at all times amenable to control by suggestion, which originate in the mental activities symbolized in Tarot by the magician, who represents self-consciousness. Man, that was a mouthful. See, I could end up highlighting everything. I don't have a pen. So in this instance, I share this tip when I'm studying for those who are researchers. Um, you don't want to highlight everything because then nothing pops out. That's why I usually keep either two or three different color highlighters or if a page is inducing me to highlight everything, then I know just from experience in the past that what's not highlighted is equally as important. So at this point, <clears throat> I've highlighted two paragraphs already on this one page. So this last page, I'm just gonna make a notation for myself to the next time I double back. Because what I plan to do is as I gain more and more of an understanding of each tarot card, <clears throat> when I begin to do my spreads and things of that nature, or when I just begin to quiz myself, I'm going to refer back to these chapters and that'll help me to lock it in better. So again, uh, the main purpose of me sharing this is not just the information. I hope I can give out some, some research and study tips because that's equally important. I know a lot of people will say, man, I can't tackle a book. It just looks too big. So part of the showing you how you can 
take a book, even though this book is like 255 pages, you can take a book, break it down into bite-sized chunks and digest that stuff. The title high priestess means literally chief feminine elder or primary receptive aspect of the life power. In Hindu philosophy, this is Prakriti. That makes me think of, of Travis Majors. Man, I, I love that channel. I recommend to anybody um, check out his channel. Uh, that brother right there, I've been listening to him for years now, at least 2017 or 2018, and he has yet to steer me wrong. So uh, I'm making my way to uh, the Vedic information and actually, the more he shows the connections, I, I can't even deny it anymore. So, yeah, Prakriti. And, 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 and as much as I hear him say it, I should be able to recite what it is, but that just goes to show. I'm familiar with the term, but I don't know it. And you can only show what you know. The pre-cosmic pre root substance, which is the substratum beneath all the objective planes of existence, thus the woman in key two is in one sense identical with the first mother or first matter of the alchemists, who often call this prima materia their virgin Diana. Diana is the goddess of the crescent moon. She is also the great Hecate of Greek occult philosophy. Hecate often, conf Hecate often confused in ancient mythology with Luna, who's supposed to have all secrets of nature at her command. I want to say this. Uh, what I'm realizing is that you always pay attention when you read a book like this you always pay attention to the God names mentioned and where they're mentioned in connection with, because these are like breadcrumbs that lead you to deeper truths and deeper meanings. I don't have my book of deities and spirits here, and I'm not too concerned because this is just a reading. I'm going to live in this book. This is not a one-time read, but this is a reference book. So uh, I would do it this time around. We're at an hour in already. So and I'm only on page 50. Let me see how many pages we have again. I might stop trying to force this. I've been trying to force it to get it read in one sit down. But what I think I'm going to do is, because I'm learning as I go. So what I think I'm going to do is, I'm not even going to tackle this book in one sitting. I'm just going to break it down in pieces. Right now, we're on the high priestess, which would be like in the, after tomorrow, I'm going to tackle the magician. So, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. I don't want to, um, I don't want to cram this stuff down my own throat, let alone yours. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish this uh, priestess, the high priestess out. And, well, you know what? We're at an hour. Yeah, all right. We write it out. I'm going to finish up this high priestess and we'll do a little talking, a little digesting, maybe go back. So like I said, that first, uh, the first 36 pages, man, the audio was horrible. It was horrible. So maybe what I do is we'll do a recap, cover some of what was learned and um, I just won't be reading as many books as I thought on here. Uh, I'm going to progress on my own, of course but I'm gonna uh, continue to do this reading uh, partially for those who might be listening, but I'll be honest, uh, majority for myself, I'm, I can be quite selfish, <laughs> quite. All right, the title high priestess means literally chief feminine elder or primary receptive aspect of the life power. In Hindu philosophy, this is Prakriti. The pre-cosmic root substance, which is the substratum beneath all the objective planes of existence. Thus, the woman in key two is, one, is in one sense identical with the first mother or first matter, because matter in Greek is mother in English. It doesn't matter. That's what the rock was really saying. 
uh, it just goes to show uh, for me the level of respect for the fine feminine. Um, Diana is the goddess of the crescent moon. She is also the great Hecate of Greek occult philosophy. Hecate, often confused in ancient mythology with Luna, was supposed to have all secret powers of nature at her command. In fact, the high priestess corresponds to all the virgin goddesses of the ancient world, to Artemis, guardian and helper of childbirth, to Maya, mother of Hermes, to Bonadia, who, out of modesty, never left her bower. Hmm, what's the bower? Probably her home or hearth. Uh, or let herself be seen by men. To Kai Bell, I wonder if that's a correspondence to Sybil, Cy Bell. You gotta be just spelled with a K. Whose sanctuaries were caves. Dr. Waite says she is the spiritual bride and mother, the daughter of the stars, the queen of the borrowed light, but this is the light of all. Thus, she also represents Eve before her union with Adam. Her number two has been explained before as a symbol of duplication, replication, copying, transcription, reproduction, and so on. It relates definitely to memory, the basic function of subconsciousness. The number two also should suggest the ideas of duplicity, deception, untruth, illusion, error, and delusion. Now, when we hear these, these negatives, uh, my mind instantly shot back up to Maya, illusion. So that's the, the inverse or the reverse or the negative aspect is succumbing to error, incorrect thinking, illusion, uh, believing something because you want it to be true, not because it is true. If you're wondering, a uh, little bit of beer mixed with tequila. This is my Friday night. Not that I'm turning up or nothing like that, but uh, I'm enjoying myself. I'm in the physical. I'm in the world, but not of it. Ah. <laughs> I'm getting it in. Um, Where were we? Okay, this is correct because subconsciousness repeats and elaborates the mistaken results of faulty, superficial, self-conscious observation, being at all times uncritically amenable to suggestion, and at the same time, the channel of telepathic communication. Subconsciousness is the source of most of the foolish notions which cause our maladjustments. Let's go back. Being at all times uncritically amenable to suggestion and at the same time, the channel of telepathic communication. Subconsciousness is the source of the foolish notions which cause our maladjustments. Autopilot. Something of this lies behind the biblical allegory that Eve was the means of Adam's temptation and fall. Hmm. And something tells me he knows exactly what the allegory is, what it means, and what it alludes to. But like any good teacher, teacher, he wants you to suss it out for yourself, get to the bottom of it, and have your own understanding, your own gnosis. And I can appreciate that. And at some point, I'm going to have that aha moment, and I'm going to run back to this book, and I'm going to say, aha. Oh, for us, okay, if you laid that, you planted that seed. So what I want to do is highlight that. It says, I'm going to get this whole paragraph, why not? Her number two has been explained before as a symbol of duplication, reflection, copying, transcription, reproduction, and so on. It relates definitely to memory. I always think of memory, I think of Isis in that she remembered Osiris. So I always say to myself, the act of memory itself is a feminine quality. 
I don't mean that in a negative way as in the sense of bad or like, actually it kind of fits because they, a lot of, not they, a lot of guys and, and women too, I say women, they never forget. They're always bringing up some old shit. And so the act of memory is a, a, a passive or negative quality for lack of a better word. And negative, not in bad, negative as in the opposite polarity of positive, negative as in receiving as opposed to giving. The Kabbalistic tree of life, Kabbalah means to receive by, by default, making the entire, entire tree feminine. Although it has positive and negative poles, uh, by default, the tree is feminine because it's to it means to receive and adam cabinet would be the positive aspect on the tree but anyway let's get back to it um the number two also suggests the idea of duplicity deception untruth illusion and delusion this is correct correct because the subconscious repeats and elaborates the mistaken results of faulty superficial self-conscious observation, being at all times uncritically amenable, ooh, being at all times uncritically amenable to suggestion. Let's go back. He said, this is correct because subconsciousness repeats and elaborates the mistaken results of faulty, superficial, self-conscious observation. being at all times uncritically amenable to suggestion. If you're not programming your mind, believe it, somebody else is. And at the same time, the channel of telepathic communication, subconsciousness is the source of most of the foolish notions which cause our maladjustments. Something of this lies in the biblical allegory that Eve was the means of Adam's temptation and fall. In contrast to the magician who stands upright in the garden, the high priestess is seated within the precincts of a temple. She's flanked by those two pillars. That's that polarity, that duplicity. Number two, um, that reminds me of uh, Gemini. Reminds me of Gemini, but yes, I mentioned Gemini. So, oh, she's holding a scroll with the words T O R A. You know, it's an anagram for Tarot or Rota. Torah. Bismillah, Iraman, Irahim, Allah. In contrast to the magician who stands upright in the garden, the high priest is seated within the precincts of the temple. The walls of the building are blue, and so are the vestments of this virgin priestess. Blue, the color assigned to the moon and to the element of water, represents the primary root substance, the cosmic mind stuff, which is the element particularly attributed to the creative world. The high priestess herself is a symbol of this root substance. <laughs> The two pillars between which she sits are those of Solomon and Hermes, opposite in color but alike in form. They represent affirmation, white pillar bearing the letter Yod. Hmm. White pillar bearing the letter Yod, initial of the word Jachin in negation, and black pillar bearing the letter Beth initial of the word Boaz. Mm. So, in, in, in every Masonic lies, there's the two pillars of Boaz and Jachin. It just, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm contemplating, I'm contemplating the uh, idea of a living tarot card that I'm pretty sure most aren't aware of. Because we see these pillars 
so often in consciousness that most people kind of blow them to the side. Oh, that's the pillars on the tree of life. But um, there are instances where you could be um, a living part of Tarot. And you would have to join a lodge by your own pillars. You know, they have just pictures of them. Every every Kabbalistic book has them. Um, me personally, I have some miniature ones, but at some point, I already know I'm going to have it. I'm going to have me some little columns. I'm going to have me a Boaz and a Jachin with the uh, with the chapters and the globe on top. I already know it. Um. Let's read that again. The two pillars between which she sits are those of Solomon and Hermes. Now, you know, if you sit in between those pillars, hmm, and she is actually not facing east. She's facing west. Because if you're facing east in between those two pillars, Boaz would be to your left and Jachi to your right. So she's actually facing west. That has to be significant. Opposite in color, but alike in form, they represent affirmation. White pillar bearing the letter Yod, initial of the word Jachin and negation. Black pillar bearing the letter Beth, initial of the word Boaz for strength. Boaz is rooted in resistance or inertia, which is the negation of activity, which is the establishing principle. Jachin of all things. The high priestess sits between the pillars because she is the equal liber equal liberating power between the yes and the no, the initiative and the resistance, the light and the darkness. When she sits in that position, holding a scroll that has an anagram for the letters to roll. Alike in form, close to each other, opposite in color, the pillars represent three, three laws of the association of ideas and of memory. We associate things similar, things near together in space or time, things sharply contrasted. The base of the pillars are cubes. Thus, they repeat the symbolism of the high priestess seat. I'm just looking at the card right now. Because he's been breaking it down and he hasn't even described half the symbols in this sucker yet. All right. The base of the pillars are cubes. Thus, they repeat the symbolism of the high priestess's seat, which is a cubic stone. This will be explained in the subsequent paragraph. The capitals of the pillars borrowed from Egyptian architecture are in the form of lotus buds. Ah, okay. Ooh, excuse me. Get tired, been up all day working. But we're gonna get this work in. A couple more pages and I'm gonna tap out. Oh. Uh, because I don't want to just rush through this for my sake, believe me. Um, I want to study this. And then also, I'll be honest, I'm new to the aspect of studying out loud. Usually these thoughts bounce around in my head. Then I go to sleep and have dope dreams and work from there. So bear with me. Um, Okay, let's go back. This will be explained in the subsequent paragraph. The capitals of the pillars borrow. Okay, let me explain this too. He's saying the capitals. So you might be wondering what's a capital on a pillar? Well, a pillar sits down. A pillar has a certain length and height, right? And diameter. It's going to be so tall. That's the pillar. But that top part, the top part of the pillar is known as a chapter or a capital. And it's usually ornamented with some kind of design or something. Here, Paul Foster Case points out that the capitals on top of the pillar of Boaz and Jachin are 
decorated or ornamented with lotus buds in the Egyptian tradition. So he's given a clue that it would be in the best interest to look up the symbolism and meaning behind lotus buds. Um, they are not buds. Uh, let's go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are not buds. Not open flower. They are. Okay, I'm sorry. They are buds, not open flowers. In this detail, they differ from the capitals in the Rider Waite version of the High Priestess, but follow the design of the as yet unpublished esoteric tarot. The reason the capitals are buds in the high priest is that the high priestess as a symbol of virginity is in some measure a type of latent or undeveloped powers. In the state of subconsciousness here symbolized, the forces of subconsciousness have not come to full bloom. And so I get that because I'm sitting here looking at this uh, Rider Waite deck and on here, the lotuses are in bloom. Uh, in the Builders of the Aditium in the Bolta deck, he's pointing out that on their High Priestess card, uh, the lotuses have not budded. They haven't flowered. Um, they represent potential. Um, just like in the Fool card, the sun is at a 45 degree angle because it's ever rising. It has no uh, descent point. Um, so the lotus buds on the capitals or chapters in the right of way deck, they're fully bloomed to, to suggest that the empress has fully accessed and uh, realized her power. But in the Bolta deck, the builders of the Aditium, Paul Foster's group, they have it as a bud, pure potential. The veil between the pillars hints that the high priestess is Virgo intacta. It's a phallic symbol of virginity, but is embroidered with palms, male and pomegranates, female. Now that I did not know. So I'm gonna highlight that. Pomegranates are feminine. I didn't know that. I didn't know that because pomegranates from the exuberance of their seeds. Okay. The veil, huh? The veil between the pillars hint that the high priestess is Virgo intact. It is a phallic symbol of virginity, but is embroidered with palms, male, and pomegranates, female as if to suggest the union of positive and negative forces. Subconsciousness is only potentially mm, subconscious is only potentially reproductive. Again, the buds not blooming. The buds having not bloomed on the uh, Bolta deck symbol symbolizes that the subconscious is only potentially reproductive. Whereas on the Rider Waite deck, the potential is removed. I'm saying it's, it's basically insinuating that the reproductivity is a given. And generally it is not. <clears throat> generally it is not. In the accent represented by key two, it is, so to say, covered by a veil. Only when this veil is rent or penetrated by concentrated impulses originating at the subconscious level may the creative activities of the subconsciousness be released and actualized. Oh, only when this veil, okay, so piercing the veil's devices. Com compare the arrangement of the palms and pomegranates on the veil with the diagram of the tree of life at the end of the book, and you will see that the position of the high priestess corresponds to the path of Gimel descending from Kether the crown at the top of the God diagram to Tifereth beauty at the center. Note also that the number of Tifereth six corresponds to the six sides of the cube where on the high priestess sits. 
I'm gonna flip to the Bizak. And that must be Gimel. Going from Kether to Tiferet. Hmm. That's what I'm going to do next. Um, while we go through these tarot decks, um, at some point, I'm going to buy me some, uh, either some, some blank flashcards, or I'm going to make me a huge chart of the Tree of Life, and I'm going to map out uh, the 22 paths of the Major Arcana, uh, color them in their appropriate colors and let that assist me in my knowing, not memorizing of this work. And again, I'm going to give a shout out to Travis Majors because he put that out there and I knew instantly that was a great idea. Um, let's continue. The high priestess wears a silver crown, reminding us that silver is the metal of the moon. This crown shows the crescent of the waxing and waning moon. Oh, of course. Wow, how did I see that? I saw bullhorns at first, but it's definitely the waxing and waning, and in the center you have the full moon. It is the horned diadem of the Egyptian Isis, another of the feminine deities personifying the root matter of all things. She sits on a cubic stone, a symbol of salt, which crystallizes in perfect cubes, and a reminder of the saltiness of the mystical sea, which is associated with the Virgin Mary. Since the time of Pythagoras, moreover, it has been taught only that the cube is the regular solid representing earth or actual material manifestation. You know, whenever I hear salt, I always think of the physical plane of earth. Um, salt is akin to salary. When you work, you earn a salary. And once upon a time, everyone was paid in salt. It also brings to mind the fact that uh, what's his name? Where his wife turned into the pillar of salt. So it's definitely a, a reference to alchemy. So I like the amount of information and detail he's given, but I like even more the hints that he drops to do your own research so you can actualize and make this information your own again. Uh, earlier when I did the first portion of this book, I had all my reference books out here and I kind of went in, which is why it took so long. Uh, I didn't bring them out. I'm not going to go get them. I'm just going to um, progress as I progress. And the next time I break this out, I will have all of my reference books and visual aids. I'm going to take it from there. Um, thus, the high priestess sits on a cube because the basis of all subconscious mental activity is what has actually occurred, what actually exists. This underlying reality is what is designated in Hebrew by the name IHVH. Now, remember, we call it a name, IHVH or Jehovah, but it's, it is actually a formula a mathematical equation, geometry. And this word, the figures required, okay. And to this word, the figures required to define the proportions of a cube have special weapons. Every cube has six sides, eight points or corners and 12 edges or boundary lines. The numbers required to express a cube's particular limitation being six, eight, and 12. Their sum is 26, which goes back to number eight if you decrease it. And this is the sum of the values of the Hebrew of number eight. This is the sum of the values of the Hebrew letters Yod, He, Vav, He, or IHVH, which actually exists 
which act, what actually exists, what really is, what materialists and idealists alike just understand and misinterpret is the real presence of that which was, is, and shall be. This real presence is the basis of all subconscious activity. The high priestess wears a blue-white robe suggesting coldness and moisture. Ready? Um, which are the astrological properties of the moon and the characteristics of the element of water. The folds of this robe show a shimmering radiance. Yes, it does. Like that of moonlight on water. So a double play on moon on the moon and water. And below the white pillar, the garment seems to flow out of the picture, which it does, like a stream. It symbolizes the stream of consciousness. Familiar to students of psychology, in Tarot, the robe of the high priestess is the source of the river and of the pools which appear in several subsequent trunks. Oh, so her robe is actually the pools and, and other trunks. So as I progress, I will uh, see that in action. That's dope. The scroll in the woman's lap is that of memory. In some versions of the key, it is a book half open. This is the record of past events of all mental and physical states indelib indelibly impressed in subconsciousness. The subconsciousness is both universal and personal. Thus, the memory record includes the past events of race history, the past events of the history of the planet, and the past events of the whole cycle of cosmic manifestation. So essentially access to a, a kosh and uh, access to um, the Akash records. Hence the scroll is inscribed with the word T-O-R-A, Torah, which is the phonetic equivalent of the Hebrew word Torah or law. Yet this word is also related to the Latin rota, from which, as explained in chapter three, the very name Torah is derived. Natural law is the cosmic subconscious record of every event in the innumerable cycles and subcycles of the life powers of self expression. That was slick. Spell it Torah or law is to suggest that the Torah is law. Mm. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. In the writer pack, there is a yellow crescent at the feet of the high priestess. This is a good lunar symbolism, but it confuses the symbolic issues. This will be better understood after you have read the explanation of the empress in the next chapter. The solar cross of equal arms on the high priestess's breast shows the union of positive upright and negative horizontal. And that's all, that's all the cross truly represents is uh, a marriage or a synthesis of negative and positive. You can also say that it represents male, female, uh, phallus, vagina, or even yod hey vav hey. It's all there in that symbol. Uh, the solar. Um, the solar cross of equal arms on the high priestess's breast shows a union of positive upright and negative horizontal, male and female, active and passive, originating and duplicating elements, polarity. The polarity is suggested by the pillars of Boaz and Jachin. It's repeated over and over. Um, what was I? It also foreshadows the completion of the entire cycle represented by the 22 tarot keys, 
because this cross of equal arms is the original form of the Hebrew letter Tau, the final letter, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Again, the same cross stands for Hecate, who, among other things, was patroness of all crossroads, according to Greek mythology. Finally, the arms of the cross are related to the number four or a square of two, as are the square sides of the cube. Hmm. I apologize for reading so slow at that last part because uh, I think a lot was said in this last this last paragraph dealing with uh, the high priestess. Hmm. Continues to drop different deities. I'm hating that I didn't have my book. When my wife was in her sleep, and I'm not going to be rambling around in and out with books. Um, okay. We are at one hour and 30 minutes, and I managed to read 18 pages. Oh, dear Lord, my God, is there no help for you? So. Hmm. Well, what I thought would be a three hour read. I'm essentially reading 35 pages. No, not even 35 pages every time I get down. Well, let's see. Let's divide 54. 20, I'm reading roughly 27 pages. Hmm. I'm not going to knock it. I'm not going to judge. It is what it is. I'm going to get it how I get it. I just have to find ways to uh, get it in. So we just read on... The Fool, the Magician, and the Empress. So when I reflect, oh, let me go ahead, I can take this off. When I reflect on Okay, when I reflect on the Fool, I said it uh, in the earlier in the earlier one, when I reflect on the Fool, uh, the first thing I'm reminded is that this is a reflection of my journey. Uh, zero and the potentiality represented uh, spirit descending into matter, getting denser, um, the fool's gaze being focused upwards. You know, he's focused on uh, the higher principles of the higher worlds. And um, what he's wearing, what he's carrying. Uh, beneath his robe is a white shirt. I know he's going to be the guest. Let me pull it up. Where did I put the fool card? Oh, I know where I put it. At the bottom of the deck. At the bottom of the deck. So, looking at this, as a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up the BOTA, the BOTA, the BOTA Fools card, dog. I don't think that's it, but let's find out. Nope, that's the diagram. Um, I know it's down here. I just gotta find it. Uh, let's write away Smith. Oh, here it is. I believe this is it. Yes. All right. Here we have. Uh, the full card, number zero, uh, Aleph. We, but it, it, the difference is in the Ryder Wade Smith deck, these mountains are blue, capped by white. And then the fool in his vestments, he has on uh, the robe, the green robe, with red on the inside with the white uh, shirt around his column, around his collar. Uh, from right to left are 
yod hey vav hey or IHVH. He has the green wreath around his head, which is a representation of the plant kingdom, the mineral kingdom. And he has the red feather. Don't recall what the red feather means off top. So, and I'm okay with that because, like I said, I'm learning. Um, he has his wand, which is also a representation not only of fire, but of as above, so below. He has what they call a wallet, <clears throat> which is hanging from the end of his wand or staff or scepter. And that wallet represents uh, the fact that, number one, he packed light. Number two, everything he's going to put in there. And then I would say number three is the Hebrew attribution of Ruark. I believe it's Ruark Elohim or life breath, I believe. And so we know that because of the all C and I, and there's a, actually a eagle or a scorpion. There's an eagle, I'm sorry. There's an eagle at the bottom, which represents the sign, the sign of uh, Scorpio. And then there's the rose, the white rose in his palm. We know that he came from somewhere to get that. Roses have to be cultivated. So he came from somewhere with that robe. Pretty sure there's a story behind it. And then we move on to the magician. Ash tripping. Okay, uh, the next card would be the magician. I absolutely loved uh, Paul Foster Case's breakdown of the magician. We see the number one, we see the uh, the roses above his head which indicate a house because it's associated with the letter Beth. Um, on his table, he has the pentagram or uh, shield, pentacles or shield, cup, chalice, wand, staff, sword. Hmm. All right. Let's go. See, I'm not gonna hold. Oh, let's go back. We cover the last card that was just discussed, which is the high priestess. Um, she is flanked by the pillars Boaz and Jarchin. Uh, one thing that definitely stood out with me and this card was the fact that. The robe represents waters running forward, or this she's the source of consciousness. And it said that in other tarot, uh, in other of the major arcana, any pools or lakes are said to be extending from her robe. In uh, her hand is a book or a scroll which reads Torah, which is an allusion to the Torah, which is law, or it's an anagram for Rota, which is Torah, Tarot. Um, her headdress is, is invocative of the waxy wing moon, as well as the full moon. She's a correspondence to Hecate, Cybele, uh, and others. So without further ado, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm actually starting to get tired. It's been a long day. It's 1248 and I got to be up in about five hours. So once again, thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you for uh, uh, enduring and sharing this journey with me like Gimel camel you know we just learned that about uh the high priestess is that it's a, a, a joining together of bringing far away things together and i think that that's an apt correspondence for the internet so thank you 
I want to say if you haven't already, hit the like button, uh, subscribe and follow. Uh, feel free to comment. Like I said, if, if I don't think I mentioned at the start of this, if you watch any of the previous videos, I am here to learn. I'm a student. So I'm hoping if others are trying to learn, maybe some of the pointers I'm bringing out or, or what I'm reading this book will help. Uh, definitely the different correspondences will help to lock it in, seal it in. Um, if you happen to be a tarot master, you've been dealing these cards for uh, several lifetimes. Uh, I ask you as well, feel free to um, tap in, leave a comment, tell me what I'm getting right, tell me what I might not be getting wrong, so forth and so forth. Uh, I look forward to it. You can recommend any books, uh, any other YouTube channels, and I, I'm more than willing because again, I'm, I'm an internal student and my goal is to have a working understanding of Tarot that I can apply to my Kabbalah studies. Um, I've pushed it off long enough and um, yeah that part so again thank you for coming to my channel occult topics with the professor like subscribe share uh tell everybody come on through and let's make it do what it do um i sincerely appreciate you all and shoot it's saturday right now i'm going to try to do or do not, there is no try. So I have a podcast, my Star Trek podcast is tomorrow. So Sunday, I will double back to the magician and then we're gonna read some more of this. I'll probably double back on the high priestess or maybe not because I'll be following her card within the next few days to a week anyway. So uh, I'm going to stop babbling. Again, thank you. Hit the like and subscribe button. I appreciate you. YG400. We'll wrap this up.